my colleague and friend, Professor Klaus Rabe from Grossendorf. And uh, the title of his uh, presentation is COPD as a pulmonary component of chronic multimorbidity. Klaus. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you. I admire all of you who made it sort of in time um, after sort of uh, probably a very short night for some of you. <laughs> and to those people that didn't make it or are not here, sort of, you know, obviously signify that they're not so much interested in something which I think is very important. Um, I got the title that when I got it, I thought, okay, that's fine. That is easy. You know what you're going to do. But you see, when you start thinking about what, in fact, you want to talk about, and if you try to be reasonable in giving you new data and sort of giving you some aspects of this, I think this doesn't work. Oh, yes. I, um, I sort of came up with a few things that I believe are important, are important to you. And it has a little bit, not only in terms of, of data, but it has a, if you want a principal look on that, because Leo, when he gave me this title, obviously I thought about this, because you can look at comorbidities or the context of the disease into a whole spectrum of other conditions in very different ways. And I'm, I'm trying to develop with you a little bit the field, how it has evolved over the last year and where I think we are. And I sort of try to give you some hints, uh, some solutions, and probably also some open questions. These are my disclaimers. I've been dealing with this area a lot because I was always and still are very much interested in, in developing and helping to develop uh, cures, ailments, um, and um, pharmacology to change chronic disease. And through this, it became very apparent that we are looking at an organ specialistic way at a very wrong end to try to treat chronic diseases. We look at those from a rather separated area, and that obviously does not work. If you look at something like this, uh, which comes from the geriatric literature, if you want, from the gerontologists, you see various things. First of all, there is nowadays, 2014, um, a, a large array of, of, of challenges for public health. And these are chronic diseases that a lot of them are associated with an, with an increasing and aging population. And they range from cognitive to neuropsychological to orthopedic, cardiac, general internal medicine diseases that share common denominators. And this is on the arrows. So the, all the, the arrows that are out there describe a common pathway leading or being associated with some of those. And as you see, they're all very similar. Rheumatoid arthritis, gastrointestinal diseases, cardiac disease, they all have their pet cytokine. They all, have a, they all little, know a little bit of TNF. They all know a little bit of IL-6. They all know a little bit of IL-8. They, they share this. But what this picture also shows is that in the center, there's something which is a terminology which is called inflammaging. Inflammaging being the fact that once you reach old age, there is an inflammatory state somehow that leads to a lot of those diseases if you want. And leading to is depicted by those arrows. Now I put to you that the direction of these arrows could be wrong. The direction of these arrows could be inward. We don't know that. But that is a very nice educational slide. And it shows us something else, which I think is very important for the whole concept of inflammaging and chronic comorbidities. And that is, up to the 1500s of our humanity, we all lived in the mean 35, 38, 40 years. And that was constant for hundreds of years, almost thousands of years. After 1500, something happened. We developed a taste for long life. And that has escalated, accelerated over the last hundred years dramatically. And it still is dramatically increasing. So for every calendar year, nowadays, the population in Western Europe gains something like a month of lifespan. And there is no end in sight as yet. So what, what has happened after 1500? After 1500, something has happened. That is, we were more, much more capable to deal with infections. Because up to 1500, we died from cholera and pest. So there is some inherent program that taught us to deal with infections a lot better. By doing this, by Mendelian laws, 
we mendled some phenotype out that is a pro-inflammatory phenotype because it's the phenotype that deals with these infections because most of these cytokines have to do with innate immunity in the, in the end. There's always a price. If you live longer, you, you experience some other diseases that otherwise you wouldn't have seen in this multiplicity. If you survive pregnancy and you're born alive because the, the childbirth is going down, if you don't die as a child from infectious diseases and if you survive early cancers, the price is that you will suffer, good morning, that you will suffer from other diseases. And what, some of those are depicted here and they could share a common denominator. This is, this is, an, in, in, is, is an introduction. We thought about this for COPD quite a long time, and I take you back a few years, and, and it's not that long ago. I mean, talking about 20, 2005, 2006, 2007, when people, a lot of people were thinking about this, this idea of COPD and recognizing from the TORCH trial, for example, hey, if you look at mortality for our chronic disease COPD, these people don't predominantly lie from respiratory causes, by the way. They die in the majority from non-respiratory causes. People with COPD with our, our diagnosis died from cardiovascular disease, they died from, from cancers, they also died from, from, from respiratory disease, which is interesting. And a lot of people thought, and Leo and I were the ones that put this together amongst other people, said, listen, this probably has to do something with, with chronic inflammation because that's the common denominator probably for most of these pathophysiologies. What we learned, however, was that even though this viewpoint probably is still one of the most cited viewpoints that The Lancet has ever published because people didn't agree with this, which is nice about viewpoints because that's what you want to do, that you realize, yes, there are individuals where chronic inflammation plays a role, but probably it's not in all of them. So this concept of systemic inflammation is operative, operative it exists, but there are individuals where this is not detectable, not in the context of what that we see. So if you have these data from Eclipse, if you look for non-smokers, smokers and COPD people, you realize that those balloons get bigger in terms of the relative importance of inflammation, but you also realize that this is the case in a proportion of people, 30%, 40%, 50%. So there are individuals where this chronic inflammation driving this response is at least not apparent. We're measuring the wrong endpoints or the concept is wrong for those where this doesn't take place. So chronic inflammation is one of the explanations, probably not the only one. But that's not new, because people have, when they looked at the phenotypes of the disease on the left, realized that different individuals would be commonly denominated as COPD patients that had an organ manifestation that classically for the if you want the pulmonary community, were not in focus, that is cardiovascular, that's cancer, that's musculoskeletal disorders. There was always the question, is it a systemic inflammatory response or is it something that has to do with inactivity and deconditioning? And that is, a lot of those ailments and all of these diseases could be brought about by the inability of a given individual, higher age, to be not actively sort of, you know, conquering and doing something with the disease. And that may lead to cardiovascular mo mo morbidity as well. What has never been answered and which is the major problem is exactly this. It's the chicken and egg question. And the chicken and egg question is, what is first? Is it inactivity leading to those chronic diseases or it's chronic diseases leading to inactivity and then you have a sort of a, a mutual agreement between the two? So the chicken and egg question is something that has governed that discussions over the last couple of years and there is some reasons to believe that there is some paucity of data, but there is some progress in that which I would want to address in this talk. If you talk about this disease as a spectrum of multiple morbidity, I have to go back with you sort of, you know, to the, the old pulmonary world. And this is our concept of COPD. It is something that has to do with lung function. I believe that lung function is grossly underestimated in its relevance in terms of outcomes not so much in terms of specifically saying how severe, whatever this is, a, a person is with COPD, but it's probably the best lacmus paper for overall health. It is one of the best predictors of mortality in every population that you look at. So the grading by lung function impairment, and I don't want to get into this riffraff about what, how to define it. I think it's completely irre irrelevant really for this pr perspective. Bad, worse lung function is not good for you. That's, that's, that's clear. But it's clear and it's true for every disease that is chronic. 
Second thing is that we realize that there are events that sort of, you know, in, in, in involve a bad outcome in, in morbidity, and that is what we call those exacerbations, and these exacerbation blips come more frequently, and they're a little deeper when with progressive disease. And then there's something that leads to incapacity and where the comorbidities play a role. And they may play a role in the more severe disease, but this area, in terms of chicken and egg, probably is a very relevant one. What we do, however, have to recognize that when we do this, and we've said this, and we've written about this, and we've pictured about this in the last 50 years, this disease produces very, very different individuals that sort of come across as having the same sort of diagnosis. We call them phenotypes. Netta calls them nice pictures. Um, some people would call them inflammo inflammotypes. I don't care. But they produce very different individuals. The question is, does the disease produce these individuals, or is the starting point of these individuals so different from the first place that they have no other choice than to go this way? Unanswered. One thing, however, already in the pul pulmonary community to me is actually quite clear. We don't only have to talk about comorbidities, but I believe that if you look at the phenotyping thing, I think it is really wrong for multimorbidity to sample this part of the disease, that is airway, mucus hypersecretion, remodeling of an airway, epithelial dysfunction, if you want, even with some smooth muscle, which is the chronic bronchitis part, with this stuff, which is emphysema. I honestly believe that in terms of multimorbidity and the consequences for comorbid conditions, to group these two entities into one umbrella term COPD is A, wrong. It's biologically wrong, it's immunologically wrong, and probably clinically very wrong. And why I'm saying this? Because I'm coming from the interventions and the management of the disease. I put to you that these two, two different entities require a completely different pharmacological approach, first of all, and they are very, very likely to be associated with a very different pattern of inflammatory responses and or comorbidities. So unless we find a way to actually sort of make it clear to the world what we think and what we say when we write COPD, I think this is much more relevant, this distinction, than the distinction between an overlap between a bit of asthma and a bit of COPD and a bit of smoking and then have a pure lung function in the end called ACOS, which is now the, the new kid of town around the block, and we have now two years about ACOS. This is important for chronic diseases. The other one I'm not so sure about. In the end, in the end however, the comorbidity part focuses so far on three different issues. It is A, the cardiovascular system, and the cardiovascular system obviously has a link to COPD as multimorbidity by a common risk factor. And if you want some other common denominators, you have the endocrine system, that is insulin tolerance, metabolic syndrome, and the likes, that is body composition in the, in, in, ultimately. And body composition also, something about the muscle, striated muscle. And I'll tell you something about the link between the endocrine and the striated muscle that for chronic comorbidities and COPD probably is of relevance. Comorbidities. If you look at this, you have an idea what is happening. You have an idea what is happening because you put this in context, in your context. You think that this guy is competing to reach a certain aim as the first one. If this is your pet disease and you're a cardiologist, you say this is cardiology leading the pack that sort of leads to this and all these are the comorbid individuals in there. I tell you, it could be the other way around. These people could be chasing this one. They chase him. Why not? Or it could be that this is a normally distributed group of individuals that just happen to be at different positions in time. One of them reaching this goal earlier, one of them reaching this goal lower, later. So the question whether COPD is a comorbidity of something else or whether COPD as the core disease that we look at is being followed by other comorbid <coughs> conditions is very comparable to that picture because it very much depends on how you look at this. The cardiologists find the definition of COPD very easy. For the cardiologist, COPD is a slowly progressive cardiovascular disease which is masked through pulmonary effects. That is the cardiologist's definition of COPD. So here you have it. If you could look at Bold as he's running the 100 meters in London, 
It depends on whether you're an internist, a cardiologist, an endocrine person, person or a pulmonary person to define what is comorbidity. And since we are vain and since medicine is made by men mostly and they are vain, they always think this is the center and all the rest is comorbidities. That's it. It's a philosophical question very much and it has to do with numbers and also with arguments in the, in the, in the, in the long run. Is it relevant? Yes. If you look at the latest edition of the White Book and you look in terms of burden of disease, where the money needs to go for research, where everything needs to be decided in terms of political will, you realize a mortality of COPD of something like 2.5% in the WHO region. Now, if you took a look at cardiovascular or ischemic heart disease, you talk it's, it's a quarter of the population. And if I may add diabetes on this, which is 1.7%, I put to you that this is a misleading figure. And the misleading figure is actually quite clear that all these individuals that die of COPD with more advanced disease, none of them has a, has a healthy heart. I put this to you. And a lot of these people with ischemic heart disease have COPD or have some sort of chronic disorder of the lung. And it has to do with the facts sort of how you categorize them. And so the approach to medicine and the approach of categorizing um, sort of specialties, if you want, has led the way to blur these, these figures, which I think we need to actually sort of, you know, come, um, uh, come, um, come to a change. So in terms, if you look at chronic pulmonary disease in this case, um, what is actually driving outcome and what actually sort of makes this disease in terms of uh, more advanced stages important? Well, there is now the concept, and this concept was developed, I hate to say this for everybody that loves gold, um, years before people thought about this in terms of having letters instead of numbers, um, that it is a composite of something which has to do in the upper right-hand corner with lung function impairment. And lung function impairment is probably one of the most stable and reliable predictors of poor outcome. But the funny thing is, if you have chronic kidney failure, a poor FEV1 doesn't help you either. If you have cardiovascular disease, a poor FEV1 doesn't help you either. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, a poor FEV1 doesn't help you either. So it sort of leads very much in terms of morbidities, you know, in, in that. But apart from that, it's extremely important whether people are symptomatic in that, and that is, has to do with driving the disease in terms of outcome, and I'll show you some data about this, and it is activity levels. That has to do with the perception of, of, of dyspnea and, in fact, the activity itself, which gets a paramount importance in that whole area, which I, which I will come to a little later. So it's not so much severity that drives this. It is probably more activity of the disease, and that I think, oops, that I think is important. So activity in terms of not so much a static value will drive morbidity and outcome, and I think that's important to say. And this is why people come up with algorithms such as this one. This is a nice paper from David Manino uh, from last year, and they looked at various factors. They looked at the classical lung function ones, that is important. They looked at symptoms in their scoring system, and they had a comorbidity index. And if you look at symptoms and lung function and comorbidity in disease, and you look for outcome of that disease, comorbidities being extremely important, they got it right. They got it right in the sense that they predict in their model mortality over time in individuals bang, ranked, ranked on those parameters that they had. Why were they successful? I think they were successful because they took all the important connotations in it, the functional impairment of the lung, and what is happening around the people. Gold got it wrong. They looked at A, B, C, D, and if you look at the outcome there, they get it wrong. They get it wrong because if you look at the classification for lung function only, you get a very nice sort of stratification between the mild and the severe disease in mortality. If you look at the new classification, you see, well, the mild ones survive longer than the very bad ones, but oops, something happened. B and C is the other way around. That is, the people that are B that are sub supposed to be milder die more readily than those people that are C supposed to be more severe. Why is that? Because these individuals that die more readily have more cardiac comorbidities, because comorbidities in that scheme don't play a role. They die of cardiac reasons. So A is wrong. I, I, I wrote what I thought about this ABC stuff anyway, but this, in terms of outcome, is wrong. It's just something that doesn't fit because comorbidities are much more important that is reflected even there. And why is it that it is so important? The data are not actually that new. These, again, are David Menino's data. 
Um, and they looked at the recurrence of cardiovascular events event in, in this cohort, and they stratified people between the normals, the so-called gold ones and gold fours. And what you see is that mortality in these individuals is actually sort of bad um, since they have um, determining events, which are not respiratory, they are cardiovascular. So if you look at a cohort of people that are prone for comorbid conditions and you stratify them by lung function, they will have a poor outcome by activity of the disease, but the main driver is the cardiovascular event in that. And that tells you that even though the lung function impairment is related to some sort of, if you want, old world severity score for the lung, it is much more an overall assessment about outcomes in general. So what needs to be tested is a frail population that has all sorts of comorbidities stratified by lung function, they will have a poorer outcome if the lung function is bad. And the reason of death would be multiple. But it drives outcomes if the volume that you have to, to, to respirate is actually limited, which I think is extremely important and puts the disease, in fact, as a spectrum of multimorbidity. And if you have these determining events, and that is the last one of the, the later data that I find extremely fascinating, if you look at determining events such as exacerbations, and you take a population that has been seen by the pulmonologist, and the pulmonologist describes them as a COPD exacerbation and stratifies those people with a COPD exacerbation on a cardiac marker, and the cardiac marker in this case being pro-BNP. Then you see, in terms of survival, that you have a clear separation between those people with a COPD exacerbation, low pro-BNP levels, medium pro-BNP levels, high pro-BNP levels, in terms of mortality over time. So it is at the determining point when you have a stratification by lung function impairment, even the acute event has a spectrum that is not only dyspnea and or what you have in your area. It will be determined by other markers, which is not IL-6. It is something that has to do with cardiac function, and this is why they are so closely related. It works the other way around as well. If you think someone that has an arteriosclerotic disease, and that is coming from the Rotterdam cardiology cohort, and they looked at individuals over 10 years of time, and they looked at the mortality of people with peripheral arterial disease. These are people with endarterectomies, uh, peripheral arterial stenosis, whatever, every sort of intervention, large group of individuals. And they measured lung function. You realize that those individuals that had cardi uh, uh, cardi uh, cardiac disease or cardiovascular disease, they had no COPD, no statins, mortality over 10 years, 50%. It's a very nice study because it is unusual that cardiologists would measure lung function. Normally they don't know what it is, but they measured it, and that is very good. So if you look at those individuals with no COPD, no statins, that's their 50% mortality. If the same people with no statins had COPD, they increased the mortality cardiovascular cohort by 25 additional percent, then the mortality was 75 percent. So having a peripheral artery disease plus COPD is an extremely bad omen for that. If you now treat individuals with peripheral artery disease with no COPD with statins, that is the survival benefit that you get with statins. They reduce from 50% to something like 30%. That's what the secondary prevention trials would say. But it is also true for those people with peripheral artery disease plus COPD, if you treat those people with statins, they go back to the mortality if, if they had no COPD. So within the, this, this context of comorbid conditions and interventions, this is extremely important to understand. And every form of guideline that would treat COPD with pulmonary drugs only is wrong, because it would not add up to the, on the population basis, and so that's something we need to know. Now, what about these comorbidities, then? Well, the comorbidities is something that exists, obviously, in a population that is 60-plus, that has common risk factors, and that has all sorts of reasons to develop in, in, in that. If you look at this cross-sectionally, and you look at a large cohort of individuals with established disease, you will find that the number of comorbidities is actually quite big. This is uh, published um, recently, um, the uh, Van Vletteren study, and that looked at the number of comorbidities, and here you are, three to four comorbidities in the mean of this population. What is it, what these people have? If you look at established disease, what is it, what they have? They have an extremely high likelihood of cardiovascular disease, but also hyperglycemia. Don't forget that. 50% of those people in this cohort had a hyperglycemic state. They come from an established disease. Steroids, what have you. I mean, that is for the discussion later. But it's something that is quite obvious that people would come along with that. With established disease and data such as this one, we do not contribute to the question of the chicken and egg. That's the point. 
because you can say once you have established this and you find these things cross-sectionally, yes, they are coexistent, but what causes the other is not clarified and not explained by this. There's a good hint that it is a cardiovascular thing because what probably is not so much known to you is also that in nephrology, glomerulofiltration rate associated with poor outcome if you have COPD. Individuals that have a high, low glomerulofiltration rate have a very high likelihood of having people with chronic obstructive lung disease in them. And this disease, together with COPD, is related to mortality. So there's a vascular component in that that probably drives these processes and COPD may be one of them. What von Flattern has done, which I find extremely interesting, is they looked at this graph, not only is it nice and colorful, but it gives you very good information that they looked at clusters of diseases that with a higher likelihood red would coincide. And it cleared, it, it's quite clear that in COPD there are two clusters where there's a lot of red. One of them is the cardiovascular side, the other one is the endocrine function, it's hyperglycemia. Now, uh, the treatment algorithm of steroids do you be used in disease disease is one one thing, but it gives you some 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 hint where you may be looking at and where you probably could be looking at at secondary prevention. One study that came out four weeks ago that I brought with me because I think it's very important for this was published in the Blue Journal that tried to address one of the questions that I said is unanswered, and it's tried to address. If you look at established disease and look for comorbidities, you will find them. But what happens if these people begin with their COPD career? Is that also then already present? And what they looked at, they looked at individuals that had sort of mild disease, which I think in principle is the right approach to take. What they did, however, is they looked at uh, non-smokers, smokers, and sort of, you know, a beginning COPD, but these people were extremely well preserved. I mean, you have a population of mild COPD with two and a half liters, plus minus 600 ml, so some of these people had completely normal lung function, so they were very, very mild. If they are very mild, even though they have 40 pec years, they are not established disease yet, something happens which is quite interesting. If you look at the never smoking controls, the smoking controls and the, the, uh, the mild COPD, there's very little in terms of comorbidities and there's very little difference in them. So that there is very little difference is the good news. That there is very little in the first place is the bad news because it's probably that they've been looking at a very healthy population. But that's the really way, the, the way to go forward. You have to look at the populations very early on to see what developed first and what sort of causes what. But this population is interesting, makes a nice paper, makes nice graphs, but probably doesn't ultimately answer the question that should be answered. I'm sorry to say that. Because the graph that they came up with is, again, nice, but unfortunately trivial. But I brought it with me because it fits the topic of that, of that theme. They say the common hypothesis was that all these things like age, smoking, inactivity, systemic inflammation, and COPD would drive as risk factors comorbidities like metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease. And now they say what they found with the mild disease is that it is not COPD driving those, but these are driving other diseases, including COPD. Big deal, I would say. The chicken and egg question is not answered yet, and I go back to my race. Who is chasing whom and who is leading the pack? You don't know that. It depends on how you look at this, but it becomes a rather philosophical question in that. But that's, I think, the biggest question that we have to answer. The physical activity, inactivity thing, however, is probably one of the determinants which is worthwhile looking at. And that is that if you even look at mild disease, which is coming sort of, you know, to the topic that I just gave you on this paper, which is still wet and in sort of almost in press, it tells you that if you look at activity levels of people, even though they have very mild disease, it is impaired. So someone that has mild disease simply doesn't move. That means a lot of you that have no COPD don't move either, which is not good. But those people that have mild COPD have a very large impairment of moving around already, which could be a common denominator. Because moving around is important. Moving around is important for cancer, cardiovascular disease, and overall survival. This is probably one of the most important papers for the physiotherapy rehabilitation area of the last 20 years. It's a 400,000 people study in, in, in China, and it looked at the effect of moderate, moderate exercise and outcome on all chronic diseases. Exercise would be 15 minutes, one five, exercise, mild exercise during the day. Inactive, mildly active, a little more active. 
That is the mortality for women and men for cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and also including COPD. That means moving activity levels is something which determines and drives chronic disease to a much greater extent probably than our classical factors that we actually measure. And this is why it's, a, it's, of, it's of paramount importance. If we look at our cohort of COPD patients where I come from, and we look at the multivariate analysis, what drives mortality in them, there is one factor and one factor only that drives mortality over time, it's physical activity, and not 20 kilometers twice a week, it is steps per day. So it's with an accelerometer, just mild exercise and steps being taken. Physical activity, that drives it. If you lack this, you're, 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 you're worse off. Why is this so important? It is important because we begin to understand the molecular biology of that. Exercise itself has an effect not only on the metabolic state of a muscle. Exercise and mild exercise drives a pathway that changes a hormonal state that I will come to, to you, that changes body composition, changes fat tissue metabolically and biologically into a different energetic state and will help you to properly sort of deal with a lot of the chronic diseases that we've been talking about. Chronic heart failure, just like COPD, has a poor prognosis if you lose something, skeletal mass. Your incapacity and your driver of chronic heart failure is the loss of body composition if you deteriorate by losing protein. It's the best indicator of death. Sounds familiar. We know this from our disease as well. If you lose weight with emphysema, it's not a good sign. Body mass indices below 22, bad prognostic indicator. For chronic heart failure, it's exactly the same. Maybe you're not so much aware of this. And it has to do most likely with the fact that adipose tissue is a very active component. It's an organ that's probably much more doing than just hindering you to close your trousers. It does something abdominally, which is important. It changes from a normal metabolic state to an inflammatory state if it's not being used, that's one thing, exercise part of it, but if it's not modulated by exercise to an extent, which I think is very interesting. Since form follows function, we realize that this is what we want to do, and this is what has to do with body composition, hormonal state, and exercise. This is what happens if you don't do this. And it's not only, it's not only body composition in the first place, it has to do with the composition of that muscle. So adipose tissues per se is not bad, I tell you. For all of you that are a little chubby, the right fat is the right thing to have. And I'll tell you something about this. Slide, and the story, this <laughs> And the story, I told you, a little fat is not bad, Leo. I mean, so now I, this is a little chubby, I said, a little chubby, I said. So what's the secret of this is, is actually, it's very interesting, and it becomes to unfold right now. And that is that exercise, compared to obesity and inactivity, is something that not only drives body composition in terms of making muscle look, making you look good, it drives genetically the information to repress inflammatory genes and it drives the capacity of fat to regenerate to a different state. The key component of them is this one, is PGC. It's a transcriptional PPGAR gamma coactivator. PPGAR gamma, you know, from the metabolic syndrome medications. PPGAR gamma agonists are those ones that drive metabolic syndrome people to lose weight. They were taken off the market because they're toxic. But PPGAR gamma drives the transformation of different fat states in people with metabolic syndrome. Exercise activates genetically the generation of this cofactor of PIPA gamma, releasing something which is a called hormone, which is called irisin. And irisin is a hormone that is made in individuals. That's nature two years ago. It's absolutely fascinating. If you exercise, you make this irisin hormone in your, in your striated muscle. And it's the same thing that you would if, if you would take PIPA gamma agonist, in, 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 in fact. What does this thing do? Irisin, released from its striated muscle, will act on fat cells to change white fat into brown fat. Now, brown fat from you, sort of anatomy, study of medicine, what was it? Children, correct. Babies have brown fat. Do you know who also has brown fat? Every animal that hibernates. Bears have it, for example. A bear only survives in a cave for five months because you have a large, large amount of brown fat. Brown fat has a completely different energy expenditure balance than white fat. So the brown fat is something that will actually regulate much more favorably energy balances in individuals. Irisin is the hormone made from striated muscle, but only if you do this, 
to change your white fat mass into brown fat and the energy expenditure and the balance would be different and it makes you probably better to survive. So guess what's happening? People will develop irising as a drug. And there's a California company in California now set up. It's a small company that wants to make this. It's a ext very ext extreme target. So the future layer would be you don't have to move around anymore. Take a pill in the morning of arsen and everything will be fine. You go back to Leonardo on the left side as you want it. Now, to make a rather complex and what I think absolutely fascinating story um, uh, short and to summarize it to some extent, where I came up with giving sort of this task which I thought was in the end very interesting and I, I learned something again about this. I do believe that if you look at chronic obstructive lung disease with or with or without ACOS, I, I couldn't care less in this case, um, yes it is associated with a lot of other chronic diseases and um, there is ample evidence that epidemiologically that is true. The common notion that the driver, also in inflammation, is inflammation, is a very challenging one. Um, I do believe that the evidence so far would point to the fact that in some individuals it is the driver, but only in some. There's a lot of individuals where you cannot detect any form of systemic inflammatory responses. Still they're driven by that. So the issue is it's not explained for, if you want, the majority of that. There's no question that lung function impairment is a very important indicator and driver, but lung function change without symptoms, without sort of any other form of symptoms, if everyone would see that's important for COPD, is probably sort of not sufficient, but it may be a very relevant for outcome as an outcome measure for all chronic diseases other than the lung. The problem is when you ask a question, is COPD a facet of other chronic diseases, well, most of these other chronic diseases have common risk factors. I mean, cigarette smoking is something we're all exposed to. They're epigenetic factors that we share in the same population. So in, the, in an individual, it's very difficult to say whether the car cardiac disease that someone has will be leading or coming later. And I showed you the, the, the race. The question is sort of what strikes first. I think the discussion is extremely relevant for internal medicine and for us that sort of try to treat patients because I will tell, and I've been telling people, that what you need to care for chronic diseases in a care model is something very different from what we do now. Chronic care models for elderly individuals need to be a, if you want, a multidisciplinary approach from a gerontologist to an endocrine person to a cardiologist to a general medicine doctor and a, and a, and a pulmonary guy. And the epidemiology would show that we need this. We need this because we need to treat people adequately. We need to treat people sort of, you know, for the comorbid, comorbid, comorbid conditions, sorry, and not only for combination products of every sort of sort. Um, what seems to be uh, now the hottest ticket um, is that inactivity for uh, the common denominator, much more than inflammation, is probably something which is one of the most accepted areas where that will result into poor outcomes. And given the molecular biology of exercise now and striated muscle and metabolic syndrome, it's extremely likely that the management of all these components would have to encompass activity levels, rehab uh, questions of that, and there's much more to come to understand the endocrine system, 50% hyperglycemia, body composition, either too thin or either too fat, and this is something that would lead to that, and that's the hottest area that's developing, and there will be much more to come. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this uh, wonderful overview. Time for one question, one burning question. We will have some general discussion later. Yeah, would you... Oh, sorry, where is it? Is that anyone... Uh, nice, the runners, nice, uh, you know, the, would you suggest, as I understand, that uh, the recommendation is cross-sectional to all the area to say whenever you have one of these chronic conditions, which is the first, look for the others and, and be able, would you give the same lecture starting from chronic heart failure? Yes, you know me. I could do that, yes. Okay. <laughs> we have to play our role. So. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's, it's a bit of the point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make, and that is, um, in biology, there are diseases that have obviously... I'll give you, give you another example. Lung cancer is not, unfortunately, yet a chronic disease. So someone that has genetically the unfortunate composition 
that he, with the same number of pack years, would die of lung cancer with 60, will not develop coronary heart disease, because that's a, a rule in life, you always only die once, that's it. That means that you don't look at the other pack, if you want, because biology determines outcome. What I'm saying is, it is just by chance that some diseases present different than others. And if mortality is, in the mean, higher for one chronic phase, you will have statistically a much lower chance to develop the others. That's what it is. And so the idea of having who is the, the front runner has to do with biology, who is the front runner has to do with ego, and people saying, I as a cardiologist think, the, it's like the world. I mean, the earth in the middle and the sun around. We've been there 500 years ago. And what I'm trying to say is, if you look at that pack, I think this is probably a random sample of individuals in this race. One of them happens to be a little further, and that has to do with epigenetics, individual composition, and the chance of the day. Because the difference between these people is three hundredths of a second at the final in London. That's what it was. Thank you.